thanks for joining us today. Throughout today's message, you'll be seeing some information on your screen about Truth Point Bible Church, a new church that is started in Payson, Arizona. Uh, in particular, there'll be some QR codes that you will see that you can scan with your smartphone, which will take you to our website uh, or also to a page where you can support this work financially if you feel so led to participate that way. Regardless, we thank you for your interest, your prayers, and your support. Now, as we prepare for our study this morning, we're currently looking at some of the key passages from the book of Acts, and in particular, how they apply to the people of God today, His church. In Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14, it says, He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now we share those verses because these verses tell us that there are two dominant realms in the world. There is the domain of darkness, as we read, and there is the kingdom of God and of Christ. And we can say that these two realms are locked in mortal combat. Each are radically opposed to the other. 1 John 5, 19 tells us that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. As such, then, there is a tension uh, between, as Jesus described in his parable of the wheat and the tares found in Matthew 13, there is a tension between the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one. Now, in Acts 4, our main text this morning, it details how that conflict sometimes plays out. So let's frame the background before we get into the details of our text. So the apostles, Peter and John, had been used in the healing of a man who had been lame from birth. And this great miracle took place before many eyewitnesses, and as such, as we might imagine, it caused quite a stir. Now, Peter explained that the miracle was attributed Jesus, to Jesus, who had been resurrected from the dead, of which he said they were eyewitnesses. And he explained that Jesus had been killed according to God's predetermined plan, but those present, many of those present, had participated in the actual plot to have him killed. And so Peter appealed to them to repent and to return and experience the presence of Christ and also times of refreshing as they awaited the period of restoration through Christ when he would return. Now, with that said, we pick up in verses 1 to 3 in chapter 4. And it says, as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. So here we see that the message about the resurrection of the dead through Jesus was a real key point of contention with these religious leaders. And these religious leaders vehemently denied the truth of resurrection, and of course especially through Jesus whom they had rejected. And their response was to silence Peter and John who were proclaiming this radical truth, and they did so by having them put into jail. And the next verse that we read in this chapter explains why this was not the end of the matter. Reading on in verse 4, it says, But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Now it was enough that Jesus' popularity had been a thorn in the side of the petty religious leaders who thought they had ended it all with Jesus' death. Now here his disciples are carrying on with Jesus' teaching, and the growth of this movement has caused even greater problems for these rather petty religious leaders. Now the following verses tell us that a trial was held the next day, and it was presided over by the very same Jewish officials who had put Jesus on trial and that they had now called for an, an official explanation as to the miracle that was performed on this lame man. And so we read on in verses 8 to 12. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, 
if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Boy, Peter's response that we just read, it, it literally bristled with authority through spirit power. So much so that we see the response of the Jewish leaders uh, in the next verse, verse 13, where it says, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. So these leaders saw something of the authoritative teaching of Jesus in these men, which defied their background and their education. And the explanation was that they had become little Christs, we might say, so to speak, because these were men who had been with Jesus and now had some qualities they saw in Jesus. So a full-blown crisis now confronted these religious leaders. The miracle was absolutely undeniable because the healed man was present there and served as a testimony. And so they were unable to silence the teaching of the resurrection of the dead through Jesus. So the only thing they could do was resort to the only tactic available to them and that was to suppress those who were speaking this threatening truth. So verse 18 of chapter four says, and when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now this was a very real threat to Peter and John because these were the same men who had successfully sentenced Jesus to death. And so they were indeed a force to be reckoned with. But then notice this amazing response from Peter and John. Verses 19 and 20, reading on down in Acts 4 says, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So Peter and John drew a dangerous line in the sand. They decided that these men were on the side of the line opposite of God, whom they had claimed that they served. And for their part, it was impossible that they could refrain from speaking of what they had seen and heard, as we just read. And this is significant because, you know, an eyewitness describes and declares what it is they've seen and heard. And that's exactly what Jesus said at the start these men would do, because we go back to chapter 1, verse 8 of Acts. And Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. So we see that this is the very thing that they were doing and it was proving to be dangerous and then it ultimately would prove to be deadly. So aside of threatening them, the religious leaders took no further action at this time and they released Peter and John from prison. And so Peter and John went to their church family immediately after they were released and they reported what it was that had happened. And the response of the church is especially noteworthy for us as we read on verses 24 to 31. And it says, when they, referring to the church, when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the heathen, or did the Gentiles, excuse me, rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, 
whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So the first response, and this is significant, the first response of the church was that of prayer because it says with one voice, meaning they were in complete unity, they acknowledged first of all the sovereignty of God. And they were drawn in prayer to Psalm 2. And we'll notice that they applied it very specifically to their current situation because if you were to read Psalm 2 verse 2, it says, the kings of the earth take their stand. Now, they referenced it in the past tense because in the prayer they prayed the kings of the earth took their stand. So they saw that this psalm had been largely fulfilled in the death of Jesus. What they prayed next is truly remarkable when they prayed, take note of their threats, grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So we see that they ask for boldness with the controversial gospel message, as well as the freedom for healing signs and wonders to be performed through the apostles, such that credit is given to Jesus, the risen Christ whom God had raised from the dead. We see that a miraculous occurrence took place in response to their unified prayer. In fact, uh, their prayer was immediately answered in that it says, and when they prayed, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So in the face of very serious opposition, the early believers, the new church, sought boldness with the message. And we see and we read that they indeed were empowered by the Spirit to do so. Now let's step back from this great passage and as we do step back from it, we see some guiding thoughts and principles that come to bear on the church of today Indeed, as with the church in every age and in every location, and so universally applicable principles that we see here. For one, many of us live in a culture that generally tolerates our presence and our work. That tolerance is very rapidly disappearing, which is rather ironic in a culture that increasingly calls for tolerance of all diversity. So the notable exception to that tolerance is those who declare the radical message of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead as the apostles declared, and of course the great message of Jesus, the kingdom of God. As we mentioned earlier, Jesus, in Jesus' parable of the wheat and the tares, which is found in Matthew 13, it explains and describes very well the truth that there are two kingdoms, there are two realms that exist side by side in the present age. There is the kingdom of Satan, and there is the kingdom of God, and they could not be more opposite or in stronger opposition to each other. Both Jesus and the apostles faced opposition from where it should have least likely come from, religious leaders and the religious community. The Jewish priest and the rulers were a, a privileged bunch. They were privileged to have had the best opportunity to know to believe and to proclaim God's truth and God's word. But instead they had become thoroughly corrupted and self-serving such that they came to oppose the very truth that they claimed to uphold. And we know that Jesus' most stinging indictments were against them. And in one instance, he quoted Isaiah the prophet in Matthew 15 verses eight to nine saying, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts 
of men. As we today declare the same controversial message as the apostles in Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, according to chapter 4, verse 2, we, we may and likely will face pushback from today's religious community in an ironic sense. Now, the main tactic that we looked at that was used against Peter and John was to try and suppress their teaching. And that suppression can take many forms today, but we can be assured that the system of the world or the kingdom of Satan will most definitely try to suppress us when we declare the radical truth. They will try to marginalize us. They will try to ridicule us, ignore us, but ultimately strongly oppose us if all else fails. A great deal of compromise has crept into Christian tradition. We must be aware, always aware of that fact. It is an inconvenient truth, but we must not be deterred from the clear truth that we see, and especially that which we see in the book of Acts, the first generation church that had not deviated from the teachings of Jesus. And in the face of compromise and opposition, we pray today for boldness and effectiveness with the untainted gospel as it was at the start which we seek to declare. It is significant that Peter and John, when they were released from prison, went directly to the church family, their support group, we might say. And time and again, we see in the book of Acts the central priority of Christian community. As has been stated before, no matter how imperfect a church fellowship is, there is not the slightest possibility of spiritual vitality without it. We cannot survive on our own without the support, without the accountability, without instruction and encouragement to be found in a Christian community. The early churches we read met opposition with prayer. They knew that they were in an invisible spiritual war, and they fought that battle with the appropriate weapons. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 states, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. So we today do battle not with guns and knives, but through Holy Spirit and also with prayer, as did the early church. Jesus says in John 16, verse 33, In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. The early church took courage in the victory that they had through Christ. We do the same as his people today. Opposition is a fact of life for followers of Christ. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Romans 8. 37. Indeed, this is the victory <coughs> that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, verse 4. Let's close out our time today in prayer. Father God, we thank you once again for timeless truth, and in particular that which we read in the book of Acts and in the fourth chapter as we look most closely at it today. We realize this theme that we see in this chapter in particular, we realize that opposition is the lot in life in this age for followers of Christ, even as it was for Jesus, as we see here as it was for his disciples, and indeed for the church. We know that we are locked in combat against another system that is radically opposed to the realm of the kingdom of God and of Christ. We have been told ahead of time through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, as the Apostle Paul said. So we realize we do not have an easy go of it. We are thankful when we do, and we are thankful for many of us who live in a culture that is not strongly opposed so as to persecute us, but we realize that's more of the exception than the norm. We know that throughout history that there have been times when government, when the system of the world has strongly opposed and persecuted and martyred those that stood up as witnesses for Christ and for his message and, and the truth of God. We understand that, Father, and we want to be prepared. We don't look forward to that, but we don't want to shy away from it. We don't want to lack in boldness to close down and to be quiet at times when we need to speak up. And so we also seek, as the early church did in prayer, 
an understanding, of course, as they prayed, that this is the conflict, but also the empowerment that comes from you, Father, the Holy Spirit, to give us boldness. So we, we do want to be straightforward and bold and clear with the truth entrusted to us. May we never apologize, may we never back down, but may we stand strong as you've called us to. And we realize that may be difficult as we face even more difficult times ahead, but prepare us for those times and prepare us now that we stand strong and that we engage in the battle that is before us, that we wage war with the appropriate weapons, knowing it is an invisible war, but it is real and it is important indeed. Father, we thank you for your truth that is spoken to us today. We thank you for this opportunity to consider it, to declare it, to allow it to penetrate into our hearts and our lives. And I thank you for each one who has taken time to share and to listen as we have shared this truth. And I pray your special blessing upon each one. And I know that there are needs represented by every person. There are needs spoken and unspoken. And I pray, Father, with your awareness, I just pray for your mercy and help in each situation as is needed. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you. We come before you together in your presence with one heart and accord in accord as the early church prayed. Thank you, Father, for hearing us and receiving us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our mediator, representing us before the Father. In your great name we pray. Amen. I thank you once again for the tremendous privilege to share God's word and truth with you. And I just pray that it would have its perfect good effect in your life. I thank you for being attentive to what we have shared. And uh, again, it's been a tremendous privilege to have you share with us. I look forward to a future opportunity and trust that you'll join us as we once again turn to God's word to study it and to apply it and to allow it to have its good work in our lives. Until that time, so long and may God richly bless.